All right, we're here. And today we are going to be doing a slightly unintended episode because most of what we're doing is, shall we say, deeper history. But there's a confluence of events and experiences that Mark has especially that we want to bring out and talk about the latest case. There's a lot of confusion that I think uh, actually surprised you too, right, Mark, about uh, people not knowing what a prop gun is? And I don't know. It surprised things. me, but their, their stridency uh, surprised me how strident they are. Okay. Well, and, you know, to be fair, we know that Mark has a, an extensive background with um, military and film oh. and things like that, you know, starting... That's it, it I, is, joined, yeah, I joined the Navy at, at six because I just ran away from <laughs> home and I couldn't take it. I was very patriotic. Eric. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, just kidding. But um, really, Mark does have um, background. So we do want to start off with a clip, if you will. Right. I, I, yeah. Just to explain that, how this ends up, this clip, because I, uh, after I, um, published MTV Magazine. I went to NYU Film School and I wanted to become a screenwriter, but I wanted to learn production so I could understand what I was writing about. So I went to NYU Film School, I made short films, and when I came out uh, in the early 90s, I became a location manager in New York City because I knew the city like the back of my hand. And there was a boom in indie films at that time in New York. There were just tons and tons of indie films going on with Spike Lee and others. And I wanted to become a location manager, not to be a location manager, but to um, see how a film and production worked, which was my was the whole reason. And I was an actor, so I got to act in different films, uh, usually with friends who were directors who gave me parts. And I was able to learn, which is the point of this clip and the point of the show, I was able to learn film etiquette and how the productions ran and how they still run to this day, which, uh, I think the audience needs to be informed what is going on here because they're being dumped into a world they know nothing about. Right. And right. most specifically, you're talking about the run and gun, very low budget indie film. Right. Um, right. Shoestring. Um, well, I don't know about shoestring, but I mean, you, you're talking about Spike Lee level indie films and, and, and that ilk, uh, which was predominant in the 90s. And this film that we're discussing, Rust, falls under that category. That's why it's important. This is not a studio picture. And that's why it piqued my interest. And trying to explain it to people on Twitter is just impossible. Okay. And this is you in action on this particular film. Okay, so that is uh, Marco Leonardi, the Italian actor from like Water for Chocolate and Cinema Paradiso. This is a film called Manhattan Merengue, which was shot in New York by Joseph Vasquez, uh, the late Joseph Vasquez, who directed and wrote Hanging with the Homeboys, where he won the Sundance Award for, um, I think, in 1993. The reason that is important is because it shows an actor shooting a uh, prop gun, which is a, a real gun, which is why I'm going to explain. There was a guy in New York at the time named Phil Nielsen. He was the top stuntman in New York. Nielsen was also a licensed gun guy. And when you hired Nielsen, even to this day, I mean, there's people like him who are licensed gun people who are also stuntmen. It's kind of an area that um, covers a lot of territory, or you could be just a licensed gun guy by, by yourself. So it's combined. In this particular film, uh, Nielsen brought that gun, gave me that, uh, I think it's a, 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 a 45. And, um, you know, I was directed on how to hold it up in the air because we were on the roof of a building as opposed to holding it down. If I, you hold it down and it goes off, you're going to shoot all the neighbors in the next six floors below you. So Nielsen, because it's the roof, instructed me to hold it up in the air. Um, this was New Year's Day, frozen rooftop in the South Bronx. After I fired that and after we did that take, we then started to receive incoming fire from gang members in other buildings. I swear to God, we were pinned down for hours. We had incoming fire and we were our faces were on the tar paper of that roof. 
<laughs> while we try to extricate ourselves from this unforeseen uh, incoming invasion from other guns. Now, this was New Year's. You know, traditionally, New Year's in New York, they don't shoot off guns like they do in Hollywood. But in this particular case, uh, we were taking incoming fire, Eric. Okay. And now the salient point of this, too, is that the weapon you used is a prop gun, as in you're explaining that a prop is something that is controlled by the property master. Right. It's a prop gun, meaning pro it's controlled by the property department. That's what prop gun does. I mean, it's a toy gun. It's a real gun with you know blanks and there's different ways i can explain how blanks are made i can explain the difference between blanks and real bullets mm -hmm. uh, the point of the matter is it's a real gun with blanks that's being fired marco in that case is squibbed up his chest explodes with an electronic squib that's controlled by a member of the prop department who pushes a button electronically it explodes a plastic bag and phony blood comes out of his chest in that. And it's not blood. even at the same time necessarily, right? Because it can be cut together in it editing. Can be cut where... together. Usually it's it's roughly the same time because you're in the same exact position. You have to get it done. And, um, you know, that's the famous uh, pen scene at the end of Bonnie and Clyde where they were squibbed up with hundreds of squibs. The most famous shootout scene of all time. Uh, now, did you point the gun at him when you were fired? Absolutely. Absolutely. Dead on. Okay. Dead on. Okay. And I, you know, actually, I fell down on that rooftop on ice, got up with the gun. I fell down, actually. You'll see at the beginning of that clip, got myself back up and in hot pursuit, fired that gun at him, as instructed by everybody, the director, Nielsen, everybody involved. I mean, that was, you know, the etiquette that was done at that time. The gun was then eventually taken away from me by Nielsen. And we moved on to the next scene. Uh, okay, however, so he handed it to you as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, there was a right. chain of custody. A chain of uh, custody from Nielsen to me. And I think that's relevant to this case with Rust. Oh, because absolutely. Because absolutely. Because it comes yeah, down to a chain of custody situation. Uh, Nielsen, no, you know, not that I was an expert at that time about guns at all, but the licensed gun guy was. And, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, okay, the, just so you know the difference. I mean, if, I, if you have a... Uh, a 45 automatic which is what that was you now have a magazine like you used in the army right eric sure okay so you can't look into the magazine and see you know the 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 dummy bullets in there what i mean look what you're looking at here's here's the magazine for my beretta right mm -hmm. now there's one bullet sticking out on top this is a 10 magazine uh for my beretta right and mm -hmm. you don't know what's below that one bullet right there mm-hmm there's, ten, you know, there's nine other bullets, right? Sure. So. And with, the chamber can have another. And the chamber could be loaded also. If you have a revolver, like in this case, old Western revolver, revolvers, if it has a uh, a cylinder that, that pops out, you can spin it and look through and see daylight or see the back of the uh, dummy bullets. Mm -hmm. If it's a locked cylinder, you can just barely spin it, right? And look right. through there. So. It's not as easy as people think. You could also be looking at the back of the blank cartridges. The blank cartridge is merely a casing without the projectile on top that has gunpowder and is packed in usually. A wadding, a little paper wadding and well, it could be wax. Paper wadding, styrofoam, uh, could be wax. There's different yeah. waddings, obviously. Right. And that does blast. I mean, if you shot that at a can, you would puncture a can from, you know, five or six feet to 10 feet, Eric, right? There's a, actually, there's another variant too. In the military for our um, M16s, the blanks were actually compressed. They they were squeezed together like um, kind of- Oh yeah, ridged. there's a crimping version of Crimp, that. Yeah, right. and, and that's crimping. what we had. Right, so, that's, yeah. that's another way to do it. There's various ways to do that. Right, that's a good point. And this particular, like here, here is a nine millimeter shell, right? Mm -hmm. And then you see the top would be removed. You'd have the casing. You'd have the primer on the bottom. Right. Uh, the primer would be right there. And mm -hmm. when you're making these blank cartridges, for instance, today there was a press conference about the um, from the police in Santa Fe. They seized 500 rounds of live ammunition from the set, and the reporters were just going crazy. But 500 rounds of live ammunition in a Western movie, you could blow mm -hmm. through that in a, in a couple of scenes, Eric. You know what I mean? The, that right. live ammunition has to be converted to blanks. Mm. And that can, is usually done in a warehouse off the set or in an indie like this, probably on the set in some building where the girl is working and, and converting them to blanks. And, you okay. know, 
So that's where we are in terms of today's story. Okay, so now this is where we start to get into some chain of custody and who and well, what and let where. Let back up on the prop thing because that's still a little confusing, the prop gun thing. Okay, well, as an analogy, R- I right. told you this one before and it seemed to work. If I go to the property master and he hands me a golf club, he'll be handing me a prop golf club, correct? It's a real golf club, but it's a prop. Right. Same as a gun. It's just we're using the golf clubs, you know, eliminating confusion. But if there's a a, uh, desk, let's say, with a miniature golf club sitting on as a decoration, that would be a a full length golf club. The same one that was awarded to him by the mayor and it's mounted on a board. That now becomes a set golf club. Exactly. Which is all design. Okay, so just so you understand, like here's here's my Beretta, right? Mm hmm. This is my Beretta. This is no nothing's in there. There's no magazine. It's empty. Here's my Beretta. This is a prop gun on the movie. This is a real Beretta. This is a real nine millimeter automatic gun, right? That you're mm-hmm. familiar with from the military, I assume. Okay. I take this same prop gun, as it's referred to as a property department gun, and I take it the next movie, and it's mounted on this board and put above the desk of the mayor. This is from his World War II service. This is now a set gun run by the set decorator in the art department of decorations. Same gun. That makes any uh, difference if people can understand that a little bit clearer. Sure, absolutely. The the prop gun itself is a real gun with blanks. That's uh, that's all I wanted to say. The property gun is really... it, they're stumbling into our lingo in film parlance, which everything is shortened in slang. In, in right. theory, you could say prop gun. If it was a toy gun, let's say, like mm-hmm. there's a scene in the movie where a kid is shooting a toy gun, that would be a prop toy gun. That's right. what the lingo would be on the on the call sheet. Yeah, one more final piece that adds to the confusion Yeah, is in the stage world, a prop gun is different Different language, different thing, but in the stage world, a prop gun is more like a starter pistol. Right. It, that, it, it, it has no barrel. It play in a sta- indoor stage operation. It's a whole different lingo. And that goes exactly. all the way back to Shakespeare. I mean, film mm-hmm. is different than TV. TV is, don't forget, in 1940s, okay, let's say 1931, right? You got a movie called Public Enemy with James Cagney. Uh, James Cagney is standing against a brick wall. They ask him to move away. They brought in an army machine gunner to shoot live ammo spraying that building at the beginning of Public Enemy. That's how they did films in 1931. Sure. Live ammo. You mm-hmm. see the concrete shattered by the spray of bullets. Now, they brought in the top guy they could find. And he had uh, one of those tripoded machine guns on a tripod. And there was nobody around, and they, you know, did safety and their sandbags and you know whatnot. But sure, sure, That's right. What... But it, it, what I'm saying is, they didn't even use blanks back in the original no. Hollywood. That this evolved to this, where we are now. And 99.999 percent of the time, nothing goes wrong. This was a clusterfuck of errors that happened on this set, in my humble opinion. Yes. So let's start with. I guess we'll go and. You know, talk about what it was. Um, Ultimately, the movie, again, is Rust. This is a uh, set shot of it. And there were problems on the set. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing we needed to discuss is that the um, crew walked off. And they were upset about having to drive an hour plus to stay in Albuquerque when they thought they were going to be in Santa Fe. There, so there was major conflicts within, and there were apparently safety concerns. Now, you've talked about the independent world can have some flared tempers and things like that, too. So it's not completely uncommon that there could right. be. Right, in low-budget film. Okay, just to back up for a second about the um, relationship between the producer who, who shot the gun, <laughs> Mr. Baldwin, and uh, the film itself, just to clear this up, because this is another misnomer. Alec Baldwin is a producer in name only on this film. He's using his company, which is a loan out called El Dorado Films, to allow him to work on this film for a very reduced rate so he could take a piece of the back end and use El Dorado as a tax shelter. So he's done all the time in indie films. There are seven other production companies, six other production companies involved in this film that are real production companies, not his. His is a tax loan out device 
He is a producer in name only. Is he legally uh, liable civilly, uh, economically? Uh, that's to be determined. However, he is not the quote unquote producer of this film. There, there are multiple 11 producers, Eric, on this film, just so you know. So pr producer is almost like a, I don't want to say vanity credit, but it kind of is. I mean, he'll get a, a piece of the cut, but it's not like his day-to-day. -day yeah, it is, it is, but there are <laughs> other other producers on it who are real producers. And and uh, they are real producers, and their companies are real production companies. His is not one of those. Okay. His is not one of those. So just to, just to make this clear, I, I don't know if it... it you know, makes him not responsible for what happened. I'm not even, I'm not getting into that. I just wanted to get into the producing part because everybody seems to be indicating that he is the producer of the film. Right, it's right, the, right. They the see film. the name and they're thinking, right, okay, he's responsible. He's standing by the director telling everybody right, how to do That's not what's happening here. He's merely an actor. Um, he replaced someone else who I know. And I know Alec Baldwin from the old days. Uh, uh, look, I'm not a fan of Alec Baldwin. He's obviously gone off the rails politically, but... I used to hang out with him 20 years ago. I hung out with his brother. I mean, I'm from Massapequa. They're from Massapequa. You know, I know him from Manhattan. He lived in the Bromley across the street from me on the Upper West Side. I lived on, you know, 83rd, so did he. And we take long walks in the city together to talk about uh, different things. But uh, this is not to defend Alec Baldwin at all in this particular case. I'm just saying in, in, in complete disclosure that I, you know, hung around with Alec Baldwin and his brother at a time period of my life about 20 years ago. Well, and, and, and the Alec Baldwin thing is a distraction in the whole thing, too. It's a complete because, distraction. Let's it's say he's John good. Smith. It, it, uh, nobody, he's, because it, yeah. that's not relevant of whether he's a good guy, bad guy, decent guy. It, right. it's I don't know. just the you person know, who is on hand. And obviously, he's fired guns many, many times in films over the years. Many, many times. Sure. Okay. Sure. Just, to, again, not to defend Alec Baldwin, just to say, and he may end up, I watched the press conference today, with a woman district attorney from Santa Fe. She's a George Soros uh, DA. Uh, they were asking her if Alec Baldwin could be charged. She didn't want to address it. She was dancing around. This is, um, you know, obviously not going to happen in Santa Fe. I'll, I'll, let me just put it that way. Right. Well, and, and honestly, she should dance around, even right. if he has to be charged I later. I mean, right. there's so much here, and that's what we're, you know, working our way to go into. Right. This is, there's a lot of meat on this bone. Yeah, so we're going to um, start off with the person ultimately responsible for handling the weapons, um, storing them, mm -hmm. etc. And that is uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, who goes by Hannah Reed, Hannah with an H, Hannah without an H, Hannah Gutierrez, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Anyway, she goes by a few different names. I think her IMDb is Hannah Reed without the H. Mm -hmm. Um she is the armor and this this next part mark and i have talked a lot about this on the side because she there are some photos and different things about her that we're going to be going through that i guess you would say are a little cringe and this is not for the purpose of saying of 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 judging her in any way, because I, I think that she's very, very young. And really, if anything, it's just going to demonstrate, if you will, a, a maturity um, problem, I, I think would be the best way I could put it. Um, you know, very, very young. She She's 24 years old. She's right in the prime of her life. And I mean, I, I was no brainiac when I was, uh, oh, I was 24. A, I was <laughs> maniac. I don't know about brainiac. I was a maniac. But, exactly. Uh, and I mean... You know, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say that she's not guilty of anything, but, you know, there's, she's in many ways a child. And I, I know this sounds right. You know, obviously she's a young adult and everything, but there are um, very, very, very serious um, maturity issues at hand. Well, there's also experience issues too, Eric. I mean, Oh, for the, sure, the, for the, sure. The, the brash reality of the situation is to become an armorer or, or a gun consultant or the gun licensed gun person or, comes under many different names. Um, yeah, we're going to we're going to be going into that and how, right. how that happened. Okay, but like here, um, interesting tweet. Twenty two years old, ready for another year of draining men's wallets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's, oh, she's not talking about me. I, that looks familiar. 
Oh, oh I don't know. Yeah. Depends on what parties you attend. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and of course, um, choke me like you hate me, but you love me. Look, you want to date me. When you Fuck me, me, touch me with the lights off and my chains on, baby. Holy cow. Was that you doing those sounds, Eric? Or that's no, from that's that that was the high TikTok. voice. I thought it was you. That wasn't you. <laughs> no. I thought you were doing. That's on the tape. That is her TikTok Very that uh, has been voice. going around. And um, I'm gonna stay off of TikTok. Anyway, so I, I'm just saying that she is she's young, mm-hmm. sowing her oats a little bit, um, a little bit wild, a little bit rumored, you know, that you know, she's there's some issues. And why the part of the reason I don't want to pick on her is you can see this is actually from yesterday. Yeah, this does not look like a deep conniving person. This is somebody who's kind of going through it, yeah. and she looks terribly vulnerable. So, I, I just wanted to show that there's a very distinct immaturity, and I'm a little frustrated that she was put in a position. This is her second movie. Um, doing this job, you've heard through some feedback that there were problems on the first movie that she did too with Nick Cage. Yeah, and well, that, movie, that movie's not released yet. So no, that, it's released next year. Okay, uh, this is her third movie. Um, her first movie is a movie called Millennium Bugs, where oddly oh. enough, just two years ago was her first movie, and, and she was. This is the strangest part of the story I recently uncovered. Uh, Millennium Bugs was a crowdfunded film um, where she was the assistant wardrobe person. On okay, it. yeah, she wasn't. So, I mean, it, it's rare that people go from one department to another department in film in general. Sure, uh, but to go from assistant wardrobe to head armorer is probably the craziest leap I've ever heard in the history of film. That right. I've never heard of. That is insane. Right. Okay. I, I I knew that she was in another one, but uh, this is her second movie as an armorer. There's only the second movie is an armorer. Only one movie has been released, and that's the the Millennium Bugs from 2020. Right. Uh, so this is two unreleased films. Yeah. So she's an armorer on um, the Nick Cage film, and now this one. Yeah. Right. And that one ha- is complete, and it should come out next year. Right now, apparently Nick Cage was not happy. She was uh, shooting off the guns without any warning a couple of times and he flipped out and stormed off the set. Um, you have to yell something, you know, firing, fire in the hole or something. Even if you're sure. testing the gun off camera, apparently she fired it a couple of times and he got spooked and went back to the trailer. However, however, Our procedures. Yes. <laughs> yes. However, the property master on that film defended her saying she was thoroughly professional had an incredibly quick learning curve and uh, did everything she was supposed to do. This is today, the property master from uh, the film, The Old Way, which is the Nicolas Cage film. Which is, you know what? I'm glad you mentioned that too, because there was an interview with an actor today on the current film who actually uh, defended her and, and said that he thought that under the circumstances, she was doing a good job. Okay, and right, I, I was, right. and this was on this film too. So yeah, you know there, there are two sides to it, and there there is a reason she got the job, and that is her oh, father. That's because of Pappy, now, and Pappy, Pappy ain't happy. Uh, no, <laughs> and Pappy is um, the great I think Thel Reed, the legendary Thel Reed. Yeah, yeah, and and he he recently I mean even you know. Uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, I mean, he just recently did the Tarantino film. Uh, he did, uh, uh, you know, Django Unchained with Tarantino. I mean, oh, he's, he's yeah, he's. He, I mean, he's, even at seventy six years of age now, he's still working um, in Hollywood. He's a legend. He is he's top of the field, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. there's I mean, nobody. He's seventy six, and uh, uh, you know, I'm sure that comes into play. He's, he must be semi retired at this point. Sure, and he probably would have an assistant armor or whatever, and be right. Which she did She had no assistant on either one of these films, apparently. No, and 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 in fairness, she grew up, pretend, you know, around guns. Yeah. You know, yeah. in, in a podcast, she talks about at about sixteen or so. I guess he took her under his wing a bit more and and showed her, uh, you know, shoot and and everything else. Still kind of green though. I don't. I wouldn't put her in that. Same category, but no, she we should have do want to assistant armor for a number of films, and, and you know, 
there she is with her dad. You know, one of the side points is her dad is a maniac also. Her dad, despite starting in 1955 on a film called Gunsmoke as a consultant, the famous Gunsmoke film, which influenced me so much as a child that uh, Gunsmoke was such a huge hit. That, that's me on the left with my Gunsmoke costume on Halloween um, around this time, and that's my first gun. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see that my cousin uh, is touching my gun, but uh, that's the full gun smoke costume that you wore. So you had a problem with gun safety too as a child? Is that what you're well, talking about? Well, I should not have let that kid, my cousin <laughs> Peter, touch that gun at that point. But uh, nevertheless, uh, gun smoke was a huge hit, and um, her father was the gun guy on gun smoke, and that's how he made his uh, bones initially. I mean, his IMDb is is rec It's a hundreds and hundreds of films, so. But yeah. I'll tell you this much. He is the world champion live ammo quick draw artist in the world. Wow. He is the fastest gun in the West, as measured in this contest that they have to measure the fastest guy, you know, drawing and shooting a, a Western gun. That's his, his uh, claim to fame. His other claim to fame was... <laughs> Besides these incredible films, he did Tombstone, and, and he worked very closely with Russell Crowe in the past 20 years. He's like mm -hmm. Russell Crowe's personal guy. He also worked closely with Ben Foster on 310 to Yuma, uh, teaching him quick draw art. So when there's a quick draw artist scene, um, they bring him in just to teach how to quick draw in, in general now. So uh, Ben Foster worked with him on Yuma. Russell Crowe was on that. But his real claim to fame, which is obscure in the old days, was in the 70s. He was the drinking buddy and personal bodyguard to a guy. And uh, that guy was Evil Knievel. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, that, that's going to make him a calm, calm, collected person to be around. Right, he, right. Oh, my God. That's a show we could do, actually. Evil Knievel. Oh, my God. Especially with him being so crazy and such a Christian at the same time. There's like this dichotomy of, <laughs> of him. But, um, okay, so this is the first individual that we're exploring, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. And ultimately, her job was to handle the weapons. And theoretically, she should be the one giving the weapon to Alec Baldwin. Right. Correct? Correct. Okay. Now, what is coming out in all the stories, this is very widely covered, so we can very, you know safely say this. They were having some fun on the set, her crew, etc. I don't know if Alec Baldwin is participating or not, mm -hmm. but apparently between scenes or on film sets, there's a lot of dead time. There's, a lot, doesn't of, mean there's, there's also a lot of horseplay, and people sure. don't understand because I, a lot of people, TV is much more controlled. On film, mm -hmm. everyone's a wild Indian, and I don't mean that to disparage Native Americans. I'm just saying film crews can be raucous and it can be debauchery. TV, usually on a set of, of, a, of a studio in town here, is a much different animal. And people seem, again, to be you know confusing this with a TV shoot. It's not. It's a low-budget indie out in the desert, and, and people get bored and they do crazy things. I mean, th there are legendary stories, even of big-budget shoots, with A-list directors that go off the rails. And I don't mean accidents. I mean just debauchery. You know, I mean, of drinking and drugs and everything else. And these films turned out to be Oscar winning films. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a whole separate episode. I, I could go into, you know, the, the background of, of Natural Born Killers, that movie, and how uh, the debauchery involved in that prison scene. But that's not the purview of this. The point of the matter is, they, like you said, they may have been shooting tin cans. Um, right. Beer uh, cans and whatnot, just, you know, in between. And, and, and like I said, I, I've been on a, a couple sets. You know, nothing, you know, like your stance, but, you know, extras or whatever. And it is hurry up and wait. So you've got to be there, not only be there, but you got to be early. And then you just wait and mm -hmm. you wait and you wait. And you're just waiting to get called. You got to wait somewhere. That doesn't mean that people aren't busy. The light people are busy, the gaffers, the grips, uh, all of them, they're running around. They're doing crap all the time. But mm -hmm. the quote talent or some crew people are just, you're bored out of your mind, you know, quite, quite often. That's why they have trailers on set because the actors will be, in their trailer until they have to come out and do whatever for their scenes. Mm -hmm. Well, I could totally see in the middle of the desert and you have some cans and well, you have three guns and one of them 
they were using and they were out just shooting cans and goofing off. Let me just explain these guns for a second there. It's an 1845 Colt, but these are replicas. They're not from 1845. These are sure. brand new. There's a new and, and everything in the props has a triplicate in case one or two things break. You go with three items, even if it's a baseball hat, you got three of the same hat, three of the same flashlight, three of the same guns. That's why there's three of these Colts, uh, 1845 or whatever year these re replicas were. So you were saying that they grabbed one and did that. Yeah, well, it, it's like in uh, IT. Um, two is one and one is none. It's mm -hmm. kind of a rule. And then they just take it to another level. So three mm -hmm. is two. Um, but yes. So during this time, they were goofing off. Now, somehow or another, after shooting, one gun had a round in it still. And it was placed back on the table with the other two guns right this table was for staging to you know where the gun was now okay. she lost and, and control. just explain again there's a prop cart and the prop okay. cart has things like these guns on it rolls around and there's props on and different things would be on there um your personal stuff might be on there plus these guns okay and her responsibility was to oversee it but she obviously lost track of a th there's a round in there and b was not in control over the weapons on the cart or the guns on the cart. Well, let's so, back up. Let's back up even before that, because the morning of that day, the property master, unbeknownst to us, uh, quits. True. And he walks off the set. And that's really unprofessional because you're supposed to call the union. You're supposed to have the union call the producer. The producer is supposed to deal with you. You just don't get up and walk off the set and quit. Now, even though they bounced checks, there was late pay, there was safety issues, whatever it was. This guy, for whatever reason, and we don't know the details of his uh, uh, background or what he did, this prop master got up and didn't come back, you know, went to, went and left the set. Mm -hmm. They then go to lunch and bring back a non-union prop guy, prop master for the first time, probably out of Albuquerque or Santa Fe. So he shows up after lunch. Okay, so now you've got a changing of the guard. You've got the property master who quits in the morning. You have a prop master who comes back in the afternoon. They break for lunch clueless. in between. What's that? He was clueless. He's just getting there. Right, so he yeah, has no he idea of anything prior. Call and says, the prop guy just quit. Can you do this job? And the guy says, yeah, he may have been the 10th guy they called. Who knows? Sure. So he shows up. In the meantime, there's lunch. And during the lunch, she's shooting these guns. Uh, from what we understand, this is just what we have now. It might be obviously more stuff coming out later. So mm -hmm. she's playing around with the guns, which is not unusual because, A, you want to make sure the guns are ready. You're always monkeying with the guns. You just, they're not dormant animals that are just sitting there. You have to oil them. You have to shoot them. You have to prime them. You have, you're constantly doing that anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, so the new prop guy comes back during the lunch, which was offset. They come back, the whole crew, and now the AD comes into play. Right. So anyway, yes, she had replaced the gun. So, But she's already not in control of this gun because well we don't know what, that. we don't know that. well for whatever reason whether uh whatever it is she did not take the gun from the cart and get it to alec baldwin that would be this guy right Dave now, this, guy, this guy breaks the chain of custody however even that is circumspect because if they're ready to shoot and she's not around he may who's he's a veteran ad this is a guy who's been on a lot of films he may have just said, we got to go. I don't know what happened to her. I got to make this movie and I'm going to take one of these three guns that I assume are all three of the same. And I'm going to walk it into Baldwin in that church. And that's what he did. Right now, the um, interesting, uh, interesting trivia point about this guy is it's starting to come out. And I haven't been able to confirm it. Uh, the Sun reported it out of the UK, but that guy was on this set. Uh, that's kind of what I heard. Also, Brandon Lee, I, I had to double check that. I think that, uh, is unverified. I'd have to look, look. At that's that. why I said it, it is from yeah, the, I have sun not, in I the UK. It's on the 1993 movie, the crow where Brandon Lee is killed by a projectile of 44. And the problem is that 93 is a long time ago. This guy's a first AD. He very well could have been a PA on the set right. and I, had yeah, no that's, relevance. That's, that's, that's a long time ago, you know, to be an sure. AD, you know, he, this guy's obviously in his 50s, you know, so I don't know what age he could have been then. That's kind of crazy. But 
the but it's out there, and I did want to, uh, yeah. you know, record yeah, yeah, yeah. it and say that I heard it, and also give it the credit. Let me just say this. Just... Every AD is a prick. That's the job. You're a nasty, <laughs> nasty prick. You got to get the film going. It's behind schedule. He, you know, came back from lunch. He's got the property. Ma this is to defend him. He's got the mm -hmm. property master who walked off. He's got a girl who's 24, has never done this before. He's got an actor who's waiting in the church, who's an A-list star on a B-list movie making 10 cents. And this guy has to get this, you know, afternoon shot after lunch. So he picks up the gun, not supposed to do that. Should have been her. She's not around, let's say. And he walks it in. Right. And um, to make a comparison, I mean, the ADs are like a first sergeant in the army. Or, yeah. you know, they're like the hatchet men. They make right. everything happen. The, the right. directors. Yeah. Again, the assistant director is a misnomer. He's not an assistant director. He's a traffic director. And and the di assistant director, again, if you're a civilian, uh, it doesn't explain what he really does. Yeah, it's no, it's kind of, um, well, it's kind of a shit job. <laughs> a it, it's a things. brutal job. And they have to be brutal. They have to be brutal. Now, the question that people in, in Hollywood are asking is who hired her? Because that's mm -hmm. the real question. We have a lot of nepotism here that's floating around. But somebody hired her physically. That could have been a producer who had a relationship with her that we don't know about. It could have been True. the director who had a relationship that we don't know about with her. It could have been this guy who hired her who had no relationship with her. Somebody hired her. Somebody said, this is Fell's daughter, and I'm sticking my neck out for this woman. And, and Would it be the line producer who handles the hiring? Or are they just hire no, the, not, not the it's No way. A lot of times it's the director himself. A lot of times it's mm -hmm. the AD. And it could have been one of those seven or eight producers who did it. It's a multifaceted task. And that's where nepotism comes in, Eric. Because let's say one of these producers knew her father really well, right? Mm -hmm. And worked on a bunch of films with one of her with her father. He could get a call from her, her dad and say, you know, can you hire my daughter? And he would say yes. That's probably, I think, what happened here. But we don't know that. It, it may have been darker than that. We don't know that based on her videos and other stuff. We don't know how she knows these people. Okay, well, ultimately, we're coming to our conclusion here. Sadly, uh, Dave Halls gave the um, prop gun, or the gun, mm -hmm. to Alec Baldwin. And Hala Hutchins was somehow there behind the camera. Right. Um, and somehow, and this I don't know. All I know is that Alec it's a Baldwin tragedy. is... It's a total tragedy. It yeah, really he was practicing right. a cross draw technique, and a, a round was fired. It literally went through her, killing her. I guess you know, not instantly, but you know, pretty quickly, and the, also the, hit the, the director. Is if you're practicing your draw, right, which I can completely understand, you're now blocking for the scene. You're out. You're blocking for the scene. He's practicing his draw. If he thinks it's filled with blanks, which he believes is filled with blanks. Why would you pull the trigger? Right. I don't understand why he'd pull the trigger on the gun. Yeah. Even if it's blanks, he believes it's blanks. So what? You're, you're five feet away from the camera and you're pulling the trigger? Unless it's a hair trigger, unless he pulled the trigger by accident? I don't know. We're not, we don't know the answer to that. No. Yet. And, yeah, and uh, that's, that's the, what they're looking at now. The FBI now has the bullets. They were extracted from the director's shoulder. That one bullet went through her and went into his shoulder. It's kind of like the Kennedy uh, shooting now. They extracted that bullet and sent it to the FBI in uh, Quantico, Virginia, to be analyzed. So if you want to take a ride over to Quantico, Eric, uh, it's not that far from you. Um, <laughs> I'll ask one of my FBI agents. No. That's one of your FBI agents. But, um, uh, you know, they seized a lot of ammo. They seized the guns. I mean, they really don't know what to do. They've turned it over to the FBI, the Santa Fe police at this point. Only the DA will be involved in the charging and the pressure from the Democratic Party uh, on her is going to be enormous not to charge Alec Baldwin. And this is where it gets really difficult. In fairness, I feel like this isn't a no fault. This is an everybody fault. Right. There is fault with, um, with Hannah. She, you know, the round was left in the weapon. However you break it down. It's a perfect she, storm. It's a perfect she storm. screwed up. The yeah. uh, chain of custody was broken yep. by yep. the first AD. He should right. never have pulled it out there. And it, he could be defended that it shouldn't have been on there with a, a bullet. So, you know, one, two, three, four. Alec Baldwin, Baldwin, Baldwin can, didn't open up the gun and check the blanks. 
Right. You know, and he didn't do that either. So you we know, have a just a, a it, it's a cluster of, 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 of a perfect storm of weird things that happen simultaneously. It really is. So, and it's no one to blame, but there's a, a lot of people are going to be blamed and a lot of people should be blamed. I mean, it's a multiple, you know, problem here, a situation that of a film shoot gone awry. All true. And so now we want to hear from you. What do you think? Tell us below. Do you agree with our assessment? Do you think we're all wet? We definitely want to know. And until next time.